Greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm Larry Williams, the director of Karma, uh, the consortium for the advancement of research methods and analysis, now hosted in the Rawls College of Business at Texas Tech University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to another quick chat, uh, the, the sessions that we have where we try to talk to people who are uh, playing leading roles in the field of research methods for organizational studies. Uh, and today, specifically, we are talking to one of our upcoming Karma webcast lecture presenters, uh, Dr. Dina Krasakova from the University of Texas, San Antonio. Uh, she will be giving a webcast in a couple of weeks on February 10th uh, on the topic that she will reveal and talk a little bit about at the end. So um, let's go ahead and get started, Dina. I think it's your first uh, formal involvement with Karma, so we're very uh, happy that you can take the time to fit us into your busy schedule. Um, it's uh, kind of on a personal note, it's extra special. You know, we're celebrating our 25th year, and so as we have gotten up in the years, so to speak, we encounter uh, and have contributing to karma people that first got exposed to karma as a doctoral student. I know, uh, for example, Scott Tony Dandel did uh, when he was at Rice. And um, this I did too. And, and Dina did while she was at Purdue. Dina is extra special, though, because she was trained by James LeBreton. And James uh, was was somebody who literally was there at the beginning with us, although he's not quite as old as some of the rest of us. So anyhow, Dina, it's uh, it's great to have you involved. We're glad you can do it. And I like to start out just trying to find out what it is that led you in the path that you're on and your interest in quantitative research and to ended up at West Lafayette to get a PhD in IO Psych. How did that happen? So, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a huge honor. Um, I, how did I end up in West Lafayette, Indiana? I applied to the doctoral program um, as one of the best doctoral programs in the nation. I applied widely and Purdue was one of my top choices and I was admitted, fortunately, and that's how I ended up there. And that's where I met James. Um, James Le Breton, um, and he was a huge influence on my interest in quantitative research methods. So my interest in quant research methods, I owe it to my stats and methods teachers to um, a large extent. Um, all my stats and methods classes were taught so well that even very complicated material made sense. You know, I have a very strong need for competence. So if I see a challenging material in front of me and I can understand that, that makes me very, very happy. So that's exactly what happened in my sets and methods classes. Um, and uh, so they kind of naturally led, led me to, um, to do research and quantitative methodology just because I like those classes so much. And then having James LeBreton as uh, my PhD advisor and mentor, James is, a, is an accomplished research methodologist, and his interest in quantitative methods was so contagious. So it's kind of reinforced my interest that I developed to begin with. It's a, it's a quiet contagiousness. <laughs> you know, uh, James uh, is relatively quiet relative to some of the rest of us, but uh, it's I've had the pleasure of watching him interact with... Uh, with the students that he's teaching for karma and he really has a great way of connecting with them. So do you see yourself uh, as a quantitative person for which your second substantive interests are sort of secondary or you see yourself primarily as a substantive person who has this other area of work? Because it's always interesting to me, the people that are right kind of on that interface, they're doing both kinds of work. So how do you see yourself? In terms of how strong my interests, methodological interests are, I would say I'm both a methodologist and a substantive person. In terms of where my methodological interests originate from, I think my substantive research interests come first 
And then by doing my addressing some substantive research questions, I find some gaps and that's how I become interested in certain methodological areas. Yeah. I think yeah. That would be a good way of describing it. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are a lot of us uh, that are that way. And I think that one of the advantages of it is that if you start out with substantive interests, it really kind of helps define the quantitative, the way that you look at quantitative phenomena or qualitative, uh, but the phenomena that you investigate, you always come back to how does it help answer a substantive problem? And I think if you don't start out that way, you look at it a little bit differently. Absolutely. So do you, you. do you teach on both sides down there, uh, quantitative yeah. and substantive? Mm -hmm. I teach a PhD seminar in research methods. I've been teaching it for nine or 10 years now. And I do teach uh, organizational behavior leadership, um, organizational behavior at different levels. So yeah, I teach on both sides. Yeah. And so, and um, you, as we were chatting, you made the transition from Purdue, uh, spent a little bit of time in Nebraska, and you've been at San Antonio now for for several years as a faculty member. Uh, I also enjoy hearing faculty talk about what they like most out about what they about they what they do. And people have different views. Most people will say, oh, I like it all, you know, but is there one thing that you that you like the best out of it, out of being a faculty member? I think I think the best part of it is um to see my students grow academically and professionally. So when I teach my undergraduate students in my organizational behavior course, I teach them something and they, a lot of them are employed. Um, so and then they go to work next day and they use it. And then they come back to me and say, oh, thank you, that really worked. That That's very fulfilling. I like that a lot. Um, and when it comes to my PhD students, when I see them develop a skill set that is that they need to produce high quality, rigorous research, and then they would produce a paper that will be high quality and rigorous and will be perceived positively, viewed positively by reviewers and editors, that also makes me very happy. Yeah. So given um, your teaching and your time and uh, and the profession and the things that you do. I know you've been involved uh, as a member at large in the methods division on different editorial boards. You must have had the opportunity and regularly have the opportunity to encounter either doctoral students that are just going out on the market or faculty that are in their first or second year. And uh, there are a lot of times looking, trying to make sense of the world and the academic world and what they can do to succeed. Do you have uh, a particular spiel of advice that you offer to students in terms of what they should focus on to um, be successful with their research? Mm -hmm. So one piece of advice, advice I would share is do research that you're passionate about. Don't pick research topics just because they're trendy and because everybody else in the field seems to be focusing on that particular research topic right now. Um, if you're not passionate about the research question you're trying to address or not passionate about the given research area, it's, it's hard to sustain that level of productivity over the years. So producing high quality and rigorous research is almost never quick and easy. It can take years from the moment when you formulate your research question to the moment when you seek your paper for publication. And so to be able to commit to that project for such a long time period, you really need to be passionate about that, about the topic or about that research question. That, that's hard to do if you're if you're you don't find it interesting, but you are doing it for some other reasons that are unrelated to your personal research interests. Um, a second piece of advice has to do with how to manage multiple research projects. That's a very common research question. Um, my take on it is to have multiple research projects at different stages of development. And if you have 10 projects and all of them are at the data collection stage, especially if you're involved in data collection, um, 
personally and managing managing data collection or actually collecting data, it's really hard to collect data for 10 different projects at the same time. Or if you are writing 10 manuscripts at the same time, it's almost impossible to write 10 papers simultaneously. You can only write one paper at a time, um, at a given moment in time, I would say that. Um, so when you have those 10 projects and you'll have a couple of them on the data collection stage, a couple of them on the data analysis stage, some of them on the writing stage and some of them on review or one, but it's easier to manage, but it also helps to establish a healthy pipeline. So by the time some of your papers are out of the door and they're published, then you're moving on to the next paper that's close to being submitted. And then, then the next data set comes your way or that you can start analyzing. Um, I find that strategy particularly helpful when it comes to managing your time and um, establishing, again, a healthy pi research pipeline. Yeah. So, you know, this the the idea or the fact that you switch back and forth, you know, uh, from paper to paper and topic to topic and trying to keep thing, track of these things that are at differing stages. And sometimes for people like us, um, they involve switching from a methods paper to a substantive paper. And mm -hmm. I've kind of found, of course, I don't do much substantive stuff anymore, but that was a harder kind of switch or transition for me. Do you, have you experienced any of that? Um, yes, because papers on substantive topics, um, and I mostly, not mostly, I exclusively do quantitative research on the empirical side of things, um, Yes, they do involve methods, but I feel that writing a manuscript on a substantive topic is different from writing a manuscript on a methodological topic. Um, so that would require uh, some different approaches, I would say, and um, just different writing strategies as well. Mm -hmm. And it also involves different dynamics when you, in terms of collaborating with the co-authors. Yeah, well, well um, let's use that as a segue to talk about one area of your quantitative research, and that's the focus of your presentation that you'll be giving here in a couple of weeks. It focuses on effect sizes. Can you give us a preview of uh, what you're going to be talking about? Yeah. So the title of the talk will be Interpreting Results with Practical Significance in Mind, an Overview of the Common Language Effect Size Indices. So this lecture will be about common language effect size indices. Um, these indices were designed to help communicate research results uh, to audiences that um, does not really want to understand statistics behind, behind the research findings or may not have uh, enough statistical training to understand statistics behind it. Um, like our students, sometimes their uh, statistical training is yet limited. They have not yet taken um, enough statistical classes or methodological classes to be able to understand the size, the uh, stats behind research findings. So common la language effect size indices, they're intuitively interpretable and they do help translate uh, research findings in, into practice. Um, these indices can be useful for different types of audiences, different types of users of academic research. Students whose um, uh, statistical training or methodological training can be yet limited. Um, it can be policymakers, it can be practitioners, it can be journalists who write about research. Um, but common language effect size indices are also useful for uh, organizational scholars Whereas organizational scholars sometimes focus on statistical significance just a little too much and we tend to forget about the practical importance of our results. So common language effect size indices is yet another index that can help us interpret our research results and better understand what our results really mean in practical terms from the practical significance standpoint. So in my, um, in the lecture, I will talk about the existing common language effect size indices. I will show how they can be computed, how they can be interpreted, um, and how they can be used um, in conjunction with other metrics of statistical significance and practical significance that we have available. Okay, 
Well, um, I'm very excited to uh, have you presenting on your topic because, um, as you know, uh, doctoral students are an important uh, uh, group in terms of who we are trying to help. And it sounds like this presentation will be something that will advance their cause. So again, that's coming up on February the 10th, starting at 12 noon. Uh, it's available to those faculty and students. It's available free of charge if you are at a Karma member school or if you are participating in one of our affiliate programs. And you can find out more about her talk and more about Karma at the Karma website. Uh, C-A-R-M-A -C dot T-T-U dot com. And so, Dina, thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts this morning, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing your lecture in a couple of weeks. Enjoy the rest. Thank you very much for having me. I, I look forward to February the 10th. Thank you. Thank you.